Welcome. This week, as Lynn and I were talking about Jacob chapter 5, we thought it would be good to pause and give a brief presentation about scholarship and resources on the allegory of the olive tree. I also wanted to share with you an interview I had with David Seeley about a book that you can download for free about this topic. I hope you find this scriptural topic as interesting as I and many of my colleagues do. While olives were fabulous sources of food, cooking oil, scented lotions, and the main source of oil in the lamps of just about every home in the biblical and classical worlds in antiquity, olives simply don't grow in most parts of the world. And so most people today don't automatically know or understand the powerful and valuable meanings attributed to olive cultivation in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon. I've had an interest in olives since the time when I was a young teenager in Southern California. We had several wild olives in our neighborhood, large trees used for landscaping. They grew like weeds, and that was part of the problem. They always needed to be pruned, and they made huge messes. But when we needed a couple more olive trees, we could simply cut some shoots off of the trunk of the tree, strip the bark, and stick those shoots in pots which we did. To my amazement, they sprouted roots and grew. And then we planted them literally in the lower, nethermost part of the gully in front of our house. And those trees thrived. So you can understand my fascination as I read Jacob 5 in seminary. It all made so much sense. But then coming to BYU and going to Germany on my mission, I found that most people knew nothing about olive botany, horticulture, harvesting, storage, historical significance, and scriptural symbolism related to the olive. Farms was then founded in 1980, and in 1992, we convened a symposium on the allegory of the olive tree, and we published a book that's more than 600 pages long in 1994 on that one chapter. Over 20 people participated David and I were able to sit down and talk about this book and discuss some of the olive practices in ancient times. I'm really happy to have with me uh, today David Seeley. David, you remember back in the day when we did this conference? That was 30 years ago. It's hard to believe. Some days it seems like yesterday and some days it seems like 30 years ago. <laughs> and what have you been doing in the last 30 years since this book was published? Well, in the 30 years since then, we've been studying lots of things, but including the Book of Mormon. And it's really fun to open this volume again and recall and remember all of the things that are in that book that have helped us to tie together the scriptures. Now, you and Joanne have been, of course, continuing your professional uh, responsibilities, teaching at BYU Jerusalem. Think with me for just a minute about the olive trees and the olive groves that you may have encountered. Did you ever take students to walk through an olive grove? Well, of course, we do it all the time. But we have an olive grove at the Jerusalem Center. And every fall, we get our students together, we find out what kind of character they're made of, and we pick all the olives on our property. And we bring them together, and we have, actually, we have ancient olive presses at the Jerusalem Center. And so we take our olives, and we crush them, and we watch how the oil separates from the water, and then we produce our olive oil. And at the end of the semester, we take our olive oil over to the Orson Hyde Garden, and we dedicate it. And each one of us brings home a little bottle of olive oil that we've helped manufacture through the process of olive trees. So olive trees is central to our experience in Jerusalem, and it was central to the lives of the ancients who lived there. What kind of, what kind of things did they use the olive for? Well, the olive, of course, is the staff of life in a certain sense there because it provides the oil, which is used for food, right? Cooking. Uh, and cooking, and they use the oil to produce light, right? It was particularly the cups in the temple were lit by the light of the olive Olive oil was in the cups of the menorah at the temple. Olive oil is the oil in those lamps. Right. And we don't often think of it that way because we just use it mostly for cooking. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, you remember when the man is beat up and the Samaritan comes along, he anoints him with wine and with oil because they use those two products for healing as well. Yeah, the wine had some alcohol in it, which would have cleansed. Right. Uh, and the olive oil, it, you know, the Greek there says that the Samaritan didn't just put on a few drops. 
And it says, he gushed out oil on the wound. Uh, he was going to do everything he could to help that fallen person. Right. And of course, you go to the Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and there's olive presses there, but it's called the press of oil, the, the place where olive oil is. And of course, Truman Madsen has eloquently expressed how that is a symbol of the atonement, of the pressing of the oil. And how long do olives live there? Well, they live, they live for centuries and centuries. And unfortunately, the Romans, when they came through in 70, destroyed all the trees. So almost all the trees in Jerusalem, probably all of the trees in Jerusalem, are not as old as Jesus, right? But there's olive trees there probably from the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries that are still alive. And they, they're alive in a wonderful way that they continue to propagate themselves, right? Like the branches and the roots, as in the allegory in the book of Isaiah chapters. And the grafting. Right, yeah. and the grafting, right? All that. Huh? The, the trees can live a long time, right? And we get to watch these in Jerusalem Center. We just walk around our grounds. We're always we're aware of these wonderful olive trees. And as a part of the economy, this is probably a cash crop as well. Right? Yeah, that's right. And olive oil would be, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the market, somebody has to make all those ceramic pots right. to hold the olives and the olive oil. And they process it, and they, of course, can send it around, right? Sell it, market it. It has many uses. And you can understand why they would think of the olive tree as a kind of their tree of physical life. Right. Well, I'll bet you really enjoyed walking around those uh, groves, either on the, you know, the Mount of Olives, of course, it's right there, but all over Galilee. Right. right. Even today, it's, it's ideal for the raising of olives. And uh, we think that Zenus came from the northern part of, uh, of Israel. And so uh, uh, he would have known this kind of uh, image and it would have meant a lot more, at least a lot more readily, it would have meant things to uh, his people and to Lehi and his people. But by the time we get to Jacob, they probably don't have many olives that have survived the journey. Right. It's uh, probably survived mostly in tradition, right? But they have the scriptures. And they have the scriptures. To begin... Let's remember the conference and the people that we had at this conference. Uh, what do you remember about the uh, conference? Was this the only conference that we had in those years in the early 90s? Well, the 90s was a, it was a decade of, of we were bravely facing lots of new things, and we had this tradition in farms, Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, that we would hold periodic conferences on specific aspects of the Book of Mormon. And the reason these were so wonderful is because we were able to collect lots of expertise across not just campus, but other Latter-day Saint scholars that were willing to come and participate. And so these were times of great celebration, two and three days. And we'd all get together and we'd prepare and deliver our papers. So this volume contains, for me personally, uh, the memory of an experience, an experience of the celebration of the Book of Mormon, of exploring the text from lots and lots of different angles, of going to be enlightened. But always at the end of the conference, we were turned back to the text of the Book of Mormon because we knew that that's a rich source of lots and lots of wonderful things. Who were some of those people that actually came out for this uh, allegory conference? I will just read you some of my favorites. Um, the first piece, actually, the Olive Press, A Symbol of Christ, was by Truman Madsen. And this could have actually been a summary of the whole conference in a certain way, but he eloquently expressed and described how this symbol continues from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the Doctrine and Covenants as a great symbol of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. And remind people what Truman Madsen's role was at the uh, BYU Jerusalem Center. Well, for a while in the mid-90s, he was actually the director of the Jerusalem Center. Do you think he had something to do with putting the olive... Yeah, I think uh, he did. Uh, artifacts and uh, yeah, he did. the Gethsemane there. and uh, Yeah, he had a vested interest in that. We had Noel Reynolds talk about Nephi uses and interpretations of Zenos. We had Grant Underwood, uh, his, uh, his church historian, talk to us about how Jacob V fit with the 19th century. We had Paul Hoskison. We had Royal Skousen come and talk to us about the text. We had a wonderful piece, Arthur Henry King, and he wasn't part of a crowd that usually participated in Book of Mormon Symposia for us. So that was a real treat to have him come talk about language themes. And let me mention that several of these projects, uh, I mean, Grant, Grant Underwood, this is 19, the early 1990s. 
we haven't begun working on the Joseph Smith papers yet. Right. But Grant Underwood is very interested in the cultural environment that Joseph Smith lived in. And, and I knew that, and I asked him if he would, you know, tell me how Jacob V was understood by Latter-day Saints right. in Joseph Smith's day and uh, after that. Uh, when you look at uh, Royal Skousen, of course, Royal is famous today for all, a whole lifetime of work on the manuscripts of the Book of Mormon. But we, we knew that Royal had begun working on this, and we went to Royal and said, how about if you focus just on the texts of Jacob chapter 5 and give us a report on that? So here we have Royal in process, developing a lot of these things, and it's very exciting to see. And so we had, of course, Jack Welch has several pieces in here. We had John Gee, uh, Dan Peterson, tell us about how olives and olive culture was in pre-modern Mediterranean. And David, look at the title that's given to uh, the paper by John Gee and Dan Peterson, Graft and Corruption. Yeah, there you have it. Does that sound like a Dan Peterson title to you? Yeah, uh, that does. Uh, yeah, he's clever with words. And of course, grafting here has an ambiguous uh, usage. Yeah, that's right. Where, and corruption, the tree decays, and you have to have grafting to Two revive the tree. Right. But he wants to show uh, how in uh, the Mediterranean world, both in Greece and in Rome, uh, life was as complicated then as it is today. Let's just put it that way. But the olive still makes, uh, it provides great lessons for us. Uh, as it did to the ancient world as well. We had John Hall come talk to us, who was a great Roman historian, talk to us about the olive and Greco-Roman religion. Don Perry, ritual anointing with olive oil in ancient Israelite religion. We had a piece I wrote on the allegory of the olive tree and the use of related figurative language in the ancient Near East and the Old Testament, a more broad view of this symbolism. We went to Romans 11, which is sort of what we all have thought is what the ancients knew about the olive tree. And we had James Faulkner come give us a paper on this. We had Gary Gillum work his magic on the bibliography. And then John Tvetna's two wonderful, wonderful pieces, uh, one borrowings from the parable of Zenos, but one on the olive oil is the symbol of the Holy Ghost. And too often we don't realize that central to the symbolism of the olive tree in the ancient world was the Holy Ghost. But when kings were anointed, King Saul and King David, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon them, the association of the olive oil with the Holy Ghost and also its usage in the temple. Stephen Ricks talked to us about olive cultures in the simple Second Temple era. And then we had some botanists, uh, Wilford Hess, Daniel Fairbank, John Welch, and Jonathan Driggs, talked to us about botanical aspects of olive culture relevant to Jacob V. We had Jack Welch, The Last Words of Sinaz, Sinaz and the Book of Mormon. Uh, I wrote a piece with Jack Zenas and the texts of the Old Testament, in which we explored sort of at some length the um, power of the imagery of the trees, but also specifically the olive tree uh, throughout the Old Testament. So here's this book that I uh, referred to on the allegory of the olive tree. In one chapter, David and I discuss Old Testament passages related to the olive tree, such as Exodus chapter 15, or in Psalm 52, verse 8, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. In the same psalm, the psalmist sings, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. A psalm like this would resonate with people if they understood something like Zenos' prophecy in Jacob chapter 5. Psalm 80 uh, also contains in verses 8 through 19 many references to and echoes of the olive tree. It begins in verse 8 by saying, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, a vineyard where grapes are usually grown, and an orchard where olives are usually grown, are often spoken of with the same vocabulary because the two, the vines and the orchard, uh, grow together, uh, sometimes 
in classical literature, we even find the two intertwined and the vines growing on the olive trees themselves. Psalm 80 continues, she sent out her boughs unto the sea and her branches unto the river. I think that the Nephites would have understood exactly what that psalm was talking about. In verse 15, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch which thou hast made strong for thyself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down. Again, the writing of a song like this that was sung in the temple would have been most meaningful if this kind of imagery and the understanding of olive horticulture was already widely understood. Hosea chapter 14 uh, also celebrated the loving mercy of God and used some of the uh, imagery of the olive tree and the way in which olive trees must be tended so carefully to help people understand the uh, love of God for his people. Isaiah chapter 5, talking about a vineyard or an orchard on a very fruitful hill. And in verse 4, you hear Isaiah lamenting, what could have been done more to my vineyard? Again, another phrase that corresponds closely with uh, Jacob chapter 5. Well, we can't always tell which came first, Jacob chapter 5 or some of these prophecies, but the fact that there are so many of these allusions to and utilizations of Jacob's vocabulary in the Old Testament would seem to say that they are all drawing upon a common source, which would be Zenos's allegory, rather than somehow Zenos later pulling these little strands together and creating the long allegory, which itself has so much coherence and integrity as a text by, uh, by itself. It doesn't appear to be a derivative text, but one upon which people would have relied and would have had great influence throughout ancient Israel. But let's finish this video with some final words from our interview with David Seeley. So, David, as we look back on this whole collection, is there any book like this anywhere in biblical literature that focuses for over 600 pages on the uh, olive culture and its importance and meaning? Well, not that I know of. Not that I know of either. Of course, we have Jacob chapter 5. Right, which is a great impetus starting and point. So we're motivated to understand it. That's the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon. So do you think it's fair that the commentary is one of the longest <laughs> books? <laughs> well, it certainly does show our commitment to, to honoring this text with providing studies about it from all different kinds of angles. David, thank you very much for this trip down memory lane yeah. 30 years ago celebrating the uh, publication of this book that is, is still uh, worth its weight in olive oil. And with this discussion, you may wonder how you can get a copy of this book, which is still available uh, in used book stores. Of course, it's out of print and long since uh, has been out of print. But because we live in a digital age, this book has been digitized. It is in the archive on Scripture Central. If you, again, just sign on to the Scripture Central homepage and go to research and then click on archive, which is just another word for the library, you can find there uh, this book, just search Allegory Olive Tree, and you'll have not only a PDF of the whole book, uh, but also chapter by chapter, you can open the HTML versions as well. So I hope you'll enjoy reading selectively or throughout the entire book. Download it, and as you get to uh, Jacob 5 and throughout the Book of Mormon, you can refer back to this.